Hello, this is Paul Check, and welcome back to my video blog. Today I'd like to talk to you about calming the racing mind, sometimes called monkey mind. A very, very common problem in the world today. Causes lots of problems with your relationship with yourself, with relationships with other people, with being unproductive, but unfortunately people like that often feel busy no matter what's going on. They could have a day of nothing and actually still feel busy because they're so, shall we say, compressed inside. And there's a number of uh, biological or health consequences to having a racing mind aside from the challenges in I, we, and all relationships. Uh, relationships with yourself, other, and the world. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is just give you a quick overview and share some of the concepts that I suggest to my patients and that I teach in my Holistic Lifestyle Coaching and PPS Success Mastery Program. This is just a, a, a brief introduction, but when it comes to calming a racing mind, I would encourage you to be careful about thinking that simple things are not powerful. The intellectual ego has a real tendency to think just because it can recite words or read something off a page that it actually knows what that is or has mastery of it. Most of the things that will calm a racing mind are dead simple to do and many people say, oh, I learned about that years ago, but don't do it. So the real secret to this is I'm only explaining this to you in hopes that some of you might have the, shall we say, wisdom to try some of the simple techniques and do them for long enough to really put it to the test. The Taoist masters say you need a hundred days of daily practice without a break to get the fruits out of any of these inner development exercises or you don't have enough consistency to develop awareness and new habits and therefore get yourself to a new level of awareness. So let's just take a few uh, moments to look at some of the key things about how a racing mind works and what happens and what causes it. So first you see my diagram in the position of the head. You have a Tai Chi symbol in the position of the heart. You have a Tai Chi symbol and in the position of the guts you have the solar plexus in which we have a Tai Chi symbol. So this represents the brain or the cognitive functions of the intellect, which means your ego, your programmed ideas. The heart relates to the sensation of feeling and intuition. And typically you'll find that your values are centered in your heart. So for example, the value of love is centered in the heart. The value of what is good or what is beautiful or what is true is usually something that's beyond the head, it's heartfelt. In other words, you might have ideas about what is good or not good, beautiful or not beautiful. And you may, for example, have the idea that you don't want kids, but all of a sudden you're watching your own child come out of your wife's body through the birthing process and you're whole heartfelt experience can completely wipe out all the ideas you thought you had. So the heart is very oriented around feeling, which is a very, very important component for not only effective thinking, but managing your thoughts, because thought without feelings are very, very dangerous. The heart is the center of intuition. Uh, I won't go into that in great detail right now, because it would be a big explanation, but Intuition and the heart are very linked. Instincts are the uh, territory of the solar plexus. The solar plexus is the nerve ganglia that controls digestion and elimination. And the solar plexus has a total neuron count greater than the brain and the spinal cord combined. This is why it's referred to often as the abdominal brain. And research shows it has direct connections to the limbic centers, the part of your brain that processes emotion, and that part of your brain is linked to everything. So the heart connects to the brain and informs the brain, and the gut connects to the brain and informs the brain. 
So with that in mind, we want to now look at Dr. Daniel Siegel's definition of mind, which is the best I've ever read. Mind, an embodied process that regulates the flow of energy and information. So in order to first look at why do we have so many people with a racing mind, we must look again at the definition. Mind, what's going on that you perceive of as your thoughts, is really an embodied process. It needs the feeling nature of the heart, the integrative nature of the heart. The heart is in, heart's the fourth chakra because it integrates the upper chakras with the lower chakras, so it ties the whole body together in one holistic living system that's a combination of the subtle or the intangible and the gross and the tangible. Uh, the emotional mental elements with the physical elements. And then the instincts give us the animal sense of should I eat? Should I go to the bathroom? Should I move my body? Um, do I need to sleep? These are the key things that many people with racing minds forget. They get so busy fretting over things or sitting at their computer trying to get things done or surfing the internet that they suppress the need to go to the toilet, they suppress their urge for hunger, and that causes stress in the body. And that leads to things like low blood sugar that then re re cause rebound, eating very quick, su uh, sweet stuff, and throwing your biochemistry all off. And this head can suppress the urge for sleep because your mind's been racing all day, so now you need to watch some mindless television to wind it down, but it might take you till late at night. So what I'm showing you here is that in order to have optimal intellect, you have to have the ability to access your own heart, and you need to have awareness of what your natural instincts are. Someone who is not connected to their gut and their heart but maybe is a professor or a, you know, someone that you think is really smart and you see the internet's loaded with people like this, is cut off from the head so they start worshipping ideas but they're actually progressively more numb to the experience they're having on the inside even saying some of the things that are being said. So now let's just look at a couple of brief things to orient you. The head's divided into the two classes of energy used in Taoism or Chinese medicine. Yang, the masculine energy, which relates in this case to outward going energy. Physiolo physiology texts show that the brain that is cognitively engaged uses about 80% of the available blood sugar any time you're cognitively engaged. If you're listening to me right now, you are cognitively engaged. If you're thinking, you're cognitively engaged. If you're driving a car, you're cognitively engaged. So the brain, an organ that weighs about 1 25th of your body weight, uses 80% of the available infra, uh, energy in your bloodstream at any given time. So for an athlete, for example, who's got a head going crazy all the time, it's a real performance killer. And I've worked with many athletes on that very problem. So the yang energy, the energy of fire, is rising and expansive. So it's outward going energy. Yang energy at the mental level or the physical level is like spending money. You keep spending, but if you don't have a relationship with your heart and your body, then you have a tendency to believe your thoughts more than your instincts or your feelings. So what happens is you overdraw your life force account and your head just exhausts your body and you keep making excuses about why you don't have time to take care of yourself. Okay, so Yang is outward going. And it's projective. The yang energy is what projects our thoughts. So many of the people with racing minds actually suffer from, you know, what might a, a, a psychologist might call the challenge of projection, which means to take your biases and push them out onto the world. So if you wear uh, blue glasses, everything will look blue. If you put rose-colored glasses, everything looks rosy. And if you put black glasses on, you can't see. So to project means not really to see reality for what it is, but to see largely what you're afraid of or what your dogma is. So somebody that's caught in projection 
may have a really hard time seeing the good, the beauty, and the truth right in front of them because they're only able to see their own ideas. And that causes a lot of racing. If you look at this symbol, there's all emotions are rooted in two qualities, love or fear. So the yin, the feminine, would be the love, and the fear, in this case, would be the yang. Most thoughts that cause the mind to race have fear attached to them. Fear of not being successful, fear of not making enough money, fear of not being beautiful enough, fear, fear of not being smart enough, fear of other people's opinions, fear of being evaluated, and the list just goes on and on. So we want to balance these two energies and be careful about our projections because the question is, are they real? So remember, reality is what's happening right now. People that are projecting often miss what's happening right now. For example, how many people do you think out there all of a sudden woke up one day 60 pounds overweight or 40 pounds overweight? Or how many people just woke up with terrible skin? overnight okay how many people just woke up with swollen painful joints etc so what I'm showing you is that if a person's not paying attention because they're in love with their cookies or they're in love with their alcohol or they're in love with whatever it is then there's a projection and that projection is stopping them from seeing reality it's not letting them see that they're causing their body to swell, to grow, and to get hot, and to get tired, and to get sick. They're causing their pimples. They're causing these types of things. So there's a simple example of how thoughts can cause projections that block you from seeing reality. And the ego has a great tendency to make excuses to justify its projections as a means of avoiding looking at reality. Because if it's got an addiction, it wants to keep having it even though it... Um, sees that there's a problem, so it goes blind. Okay? So, the question whenever you've got a racing mind is, what are you creating? Remember, thoughts are seeds. There you see that in yang is the seed of yin. So your thoughts give birth to probabilities. The more energy you keep putting around any given thought, I hate that guy, or so-and-so is this, or so-and-so is that, or... I don't like my face or my boobs or whatever, then the more you manifest the potential for that reality to take place, which in psychoneuroimmunology they've done lots of research on. So people that constantly say things like, so-and-so broke my heart, will eventually start showing significant stress signs in the heart and all factors related and so on. So thoughts are seeds, emotions add water. So thinking, oh, I need to get the laundry done today, that's one thing. But thinking, I can't believe I've got to do the laundry for that pig of a husband of mine again. Now that adds a whole bunch of water to the seed and puts a negative connotation. And that's not growing fruit, that's going to grow weeds. And then actions embody. But remember, as soon as you start putting words to a thought, you're already in the action stage. You are not only in the word stage, vibration, but you're putting action to it because speaking is an active process. So you're taking it deeper into the behavioral system. So when we have a racing mind and thoughts of a negative orientation or thoughts that are stressful by our own judgment, we activate the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight, fight, flight, or freeze nervous system, which is your classic stress response which produces an increased consumption of energy and resources. Not just energy, nutrition and all resources. Hormones get utilized, everything gets utilized. So we need to have an adequate counterbalance for all that. The yin relates to the inward life, balancing the outward with the inward. A lot of this stuff happens, this cutting off the head, happens because people orient themselves with what they're doing outside of themselves, what they see in the mirror, and other people's opinion, which is an outside viewpoint. But we have to, to be healthy, we've got to spend enough time inside of ourselves having a relationship with ourselves, or we never really know if it's true. If someone says you're, um, shall we say, they say that you're uh, cheap, 
But if inside your heart you know you're not cheap and that you're a generous person, then you already know that that's just their opinion and there's nothing to get upset about because, you know, as they say, opinions are like assholes and everyone's got one. So if you don't spend enough time inside of yourself to get to know yourself and have an authentic sense of who you really are, you're dangerously at risk of believing what other people say, which will keep you in a yang state. Yin is all about feeling and listening to your instincts. So if you're not inside, how can you know how hungry you are, or how thirsty you are, or how tired you are, or whether you need to move your body? How can you know if you're feeling love or fear if you're not willing to actually feel what you're experiencing and say, how does that relate to my values? It's very, very tricky. Most people are so way out here and so externalized that they really don't know who they are. Most of them are just emulating movie stars and sports stars and, and you know, television figures and uh, icons without any conscious awareness that they're often emulating people that are really already quite sick, many of them. Okay? So inward yin is receptive, inward and yin embody. So it's the yin function that actually embodies your thoughts. But if you have too much yang energy, it can't embody a healthy, balanced process. It embodies a disordered process, like you will embody adrenal exhaustion if you keep that up. You will embody back pain. You will embody uh, inflammation and a leaky gut syndrome. And there's many, many things. Remember, stress is the number one cause of all diseases of every type. So as you see in yellow here, embody means to hold on to. So using the methods I'm going to share, when you're getting these projections or this racy mind and you're thinking thoughts repetitiously that could be detrimental, you always want to ask yourself, do I really want to hold on to this? Because the in function takes this for granted. In other words, if you think it, it believes it. You have to have discernment in order to filter out what thoughts you want to allow into you to embody themselves and which ones you don't. And remember, your life is always mirroring back to you, so is the mirror what you have embodied. No matter what you say, you cannot avoid the responsibility and the truth that we are all living mirrors of our own choices, which are the results of our own thoughts. The yin system is the functional antagonist to the yang system, so parasympathetic is the anabolic, where the sympathetic is the catabolic. Catabolic means tissue destructive, uh, i.e. fire, transformative. Yin means to reconstruct, rebuild, repair, and to grow. And the yin function is what, what a mother uses to grow a fetus inside of her. Once it's born and starts to breathe, then the yang function becomes dominant. But there you go. Yin swells from the inside out, multiplies energy, so it builds things. Yang goes, sends its energy outward, dividing energy in every direction, but progressively shrinks itself down until it's gone. Okay? So the parasympathetic function is anabolic and it calms us. And when we listen to our feelings and our intuition, and remember our feelings relate to our values, and don't get stuck in superficial opinions, we if we're not sure about something with our head, so-and-so says I'm an asshole, is it true? Well, if you say to yourself on the inside, I am not that way, and you feel centered in your own response to that judgment, it's probably true that you are not that way. But if somebody tells you, uh, gives you a criticism, you're not this or you're not that, but when you're centered in your own heart, you can be honest with yourself and say, well, you know, I am a little bit too late too often, or I am having challenges in my relationships by being late, or I have had this problem in my last three jobs or whatever. That's fine. Now it's the chance to say, okay, the pattern is here. I see the, the pattern emerging, and I'm willing to take responsible uh, actions now. And then what looks like criticism actually becomes the gift of constructive criticism, without which we aren't likely to grow. Unfortunately, when you get your head cut off here, almost any form of constructive, criti constructive criticism is interpreted as destructive criticism, even when you need it. Okay. 
So now, with that introduction, let's look at the um, wise and interesting words of an ancient Indian sage, Vasishta. Better the rock-bound toad, better the crawling earthworm, better the cave serpent than the man without inquiry. inquiry. What is he saying? He's saying, if you're a rock-bound toad, an earthworm, or a cave serpent who can't see, you're in a better position than a person who believes their thoughts without inquiring to see whether they're true, as Byron Katie and many others have inspired us to do. Inquiring into your thoughts is what Paul Brunton, a very uh, respectable philosopher, calls philosophy. <laughs> so I think that's interesting. And philosophy means the love of wisdom. So to inquire about your own thoughts and not believe them is philosophy. To be interested in wisdom, which is the synthesis of knowledge, which is that which is closest to the truth, really. So you can either wait till you're you know, 40 or, or 50 and have enough pain to say, I've got to stop acting like a child, or you can say, I can have an interest in what I'm creating, and I can have an interest in producing wisdom and being productive in the creation of my own dreams now, and then think how much the wiser you will be by the time you get to be 40 or 50. So in other words, what I'm saying is, these kinds of concepts aren't the kinds of things kids usually come running up for help with because they're so unconscious that they're trapped in emulating their parents and other people, they don't even know what's happening to them. But if this kind of stuff is practiced by young people, by the time they're mature people, they're significantly more wise than even most old people today. And I would say with the challenges we have going on in the world right now, we need a batch of very wise young people coming up, but I'm concerned that you know, MTV and uh, cell phones and, uh, you know, social media isn't really going to get you there because oftentimes what you see being traded as comments back and forth really represent um, a lot of detachment from feelings, instincts, good, beauty, and truth, but more just reactive, racing, mental, ready, fire, aim behavior. So what are my plans here? Uh, first of all, if you want to learn more, much more detail, you can go to PPS Success Mastery Lesson 1, How to Find and Live Your Legacy, which helps you identify where the most painful events in your life were and gives you training on how to find the beauty in those things and look equally for the good that was in them, not just focusing on the bad, which is the classic behavior here. And then PPS Lesson 2 shows you the science of self-mastery, how the brain is programmed, how brainwashing takes place, and how to use the science to heal yourself of what I call mind viruses, which are thoughts that repeatedly pester the hell out of you that are you know, often not pleasant. Okay? Then we have the one, two, three, four for overcoming addiction, obesity, and disease. Uh, that's my nine-hour audio program and about a 134-page workbook that takes you through a process of learning how to manage your mind and rehabilitate or optimize your heart and body so that you have integrated um, capacity to think and feel. And it gives you a comprehensive training on what love is and how love works in life. And I think for a lot of people, it's quite interesting and awakening. So... Then you can take HLC-1. HLC-1 is another, you don't have to do those first, but HLC-1 is a course where you learn how to use, how to eat, move, and be healthy, but you learn a lot about how to live so that your instincts are working, your heart is healthy, and you make good choices, and that changes your biochemistry, and a lot of this racing mind comes from, an, shall we say, an uneducated uneducate, approach to diet and lifestyle, an uneducated approach to religious uh, beliefs and interpretations and uh, helps you really get yourself in a place where the quest is a lot easier because much of what causes people's uh, minds to race is really biochemical imbalances and imbalances in 
the key factors, nutrition, hydration, sleep, breathing, thinking, and movement. So when we go to dealing with a racy mind, first is what is your dream? We all have piles of thoughts. Deepak Chopra says we have about 68,000 thoughts a day. Other researchers say about 90% of those are negative. That's not a good statistic for the average person out there. But once you know what your dream is, you automatically have a filtration system. Your dream is like your compass coordinates or your GPS coordinates. So up here you see we have movement and quiet. That represents the energy axis of the universe or what a Taoist would call the Tao. There's obviously energy out there. The sun is shining. The earth is rotating. The moon is moving. The cosmos is dynamic. So that represents free energy. That's what happens when you live in tune with the seasons. You eat in accordance with the seasons and you live the four doctors that I teach and the methods I teach and how to eat, move, and be healthy, you are getting free energy. If you're not getting the free energy, you've got to compensate, and a lot of that compensation comes by way of bad diet. And stimulants, coffee, sugar, tea, soda, the list goes on, but those are energy substances that not only are toxic, but, but disrupt your biochemistry and come at a long-range cost. So first, we want to access free energy. Happiness is what gives us our values, and through our values, we make choices. So the arrow points to Dr. Diet because we have a the mind has a diet for thoughts, an appetite for thoughts. The heart has an appetite for feelings, and the body has an appetite for food and water. So we got to remember each of those different levels of our being. The mental body feeds on thoughts. The emotional body feeds on emotions and feelings, the heart, and the physical body feeds on food and needs hydration from water. So your values relate to your dream. Uh, this is all right out of the Four Doctors ebook. Um, the last Four Doctors, you'll ever need how to get healthy now. Uh, you can get that at thecheckinstitute.com or ppssuccess.com, which is where you can find those as well. Remember, without values, you don't know when to say yes and say no. If somebody offers me um, two carrots and they say that one's organic and that one's not, it's easy choice. If I go to a restaurant, if I'm out with friends looking for a place to eat at and I say to them, do you have any organic uh, meal items? And they say no, chances are good I'm not going to eat there. I don't want to poison myself. So what I'm saying is if you don't have values, you don't know how to choose and therefore you are likely to make decisions that put you in a state of stress that make your mind race. So remember your yes has no value until you learn to say no. You cannot learn that without values, stated core values is what we call them. Three is choices. Your choices ultimately determine what you select. If someone says you're an asshole and you believe it, then your happiness awareness factor, your value system has chosen the diet of believing that you're an asshole or whatever they said you were. But if you have a filtration system, which includes knowing whose opinion is worth listening to because you have values, then you're going to have a lot less of that negative emotion. If you start believing people, remember you start projecting it. Okay, and that's a bad news. Okay, so are your choices dream affirmative? Once you know what direction you're going and your thoughts are rising up and you're having thoughts that may or may not be dream affirmative, you know that if those negative thoughts are there, then they're not thoughts that you want to energize. So you take advantage of the fact that the pain teacher has showed up in your life. Thoughts that indicate self-negation. I'm not good. I'm not beautiful. I'm not this are, shall we say, the bulk of a lot of people's negative thinking. So though any of those thoughts that are self-negating are visits from the pain teacher, anything that gives you a stress response that's unhealthy. In other words, it's one thing to have a stress response because you're in a legitimate crisis, but it's another thing to create a stress response and be a hypochondriac or a fanatic everywhere you go and drive people and yourself crazy. Whenever you have a negative thought that comes up or especially comes up repeatedly, that is not moving your energy in the direction of your dream. In other words, a negative thought is antagonistic to your dream. It's seeding what you don't want. 
So anytime you have the seeds of what you don't want, we do not want to water those seeds, we immediately thank our pain teacher. Ah, if you feel that negative, painful emotion or feeling, you've been warned that that's what you're creating. So we say thank you to your pain teacher. State your dream out loud. I successfully run and manage the Czech Institute who shares holistic health teachings worldwide. Not I want to or I'm going to. Always state your dream in the affirmative. Okay, so state dream in affirmative. And by stating the dream in the affirmative, not I'm an asshole, I run the Czech Institute and we successfully share holistic health teachings with the world. That energizes the neural network that resonates with that thought. So each time you have the negative thought, you state your dream out loud and you state your dream in affirmation to replace the negative thought. So you start pumping energy through those neurons and it starts to reestablish the flow of energy out of the old conditioned pathway, progressively into the new conditioned pathway. And lo and behold, if you do a gong 100 days straight, you will probably find sometime in that 100 days those thoughts just stop coming because it now takes more energy to run that old stinking thinking than it does to run it through the new neural network. And if you keep practicing, the more you practice, the faster you reconstruct a new neural network that is dream affirmative, which means you're making a healthy energy investment. Okay? Uh, thank the pain teacher. I always say thank you to your pain teacher for showing me where I have a mind virus and then I state the dream out loud. Then I state the positive dream supportive thought to antagonize. But don't wrestle with your negative thoughts. The more you wrestle them, the further you drive the old pathway in. Do not wrestle with the dragon of negativity because its trick is any move to try to win that battle enhances the battle, which means reinforces the negative neural network. So then breathing. Breathing is one of the simplest things that you can do. If you're overwhelmed by all this, then when your mind starts to race, simply switch to your breathing, relax your face, relax your jaw, relax your tongue. Let your tongue sit on the roof of your mouth behind your front teeth, which is where it'll go right when you swallow. There it is. And then inhale through your nose. Let your belly expand. First two thirds of the breath from the belly. And then just let it go. And just breathe the stress right out of yourself. Six to 12 breaths, easy. Very easy to do. But within six to 12 breaths of just focusing on your breathing, because if you're focusing on your breathing, you can't be focusing on your negative thoughts. That's the key point here. I feel the breath coming in through my nose. I feel my belly expanding. Only in the last one third of the breath should the chest rise. I'm letting go. I feel the breath moving through my nose, into my lungs. I feel my belly and my body expanding. I'm letting go. All you've got to do is think and state what you're experiencing. I'm breathing in through my nose. I feel air entering my lungs. My belly is expanding. I'm feeling a rise of energy. I am letting go. And that means you cannot possibly be thinking the negative thought. So practicing that alone simply gets you out of the habit of buying into the negative thinking. And it's like a snowball. The more you think negatively, the bigger it gets as you roll it down the hill. And negative thinking can run away with itself. Finally, pure thought is a Buddhist meditation. Um, pure thoughts are thoughts that, uh, shall we say, don't really have any judgment attached to them. Uh, uh, one of the pure thought methods that I use, I've been using for years, which I find very, very helpful, is whenever you have a challenge like this, like your mind starts to race, as you inhale, just think and focus on the sun is rising in my being. And I visualize as I'm breathing in, when I start the breath, the sun rising up my spine. 
So right when I get to the top of the full belly breath, the sun's sitting right here on my crown. And then as I exhale, out through the nose, in through the nose and out through the nose, or out through the mouth and nose, as I exhale, the moon settles in my being. And when the breath is at its end, the moon is right down here in the perineum, and as I begin to inhale, it magically turns into the sun, just like the sun rising up over the horizon. And at the top of the breath, I see inside my inner vision a beautiful sun shining through the crown chakra. And then the moon settles in my being. And you'd be amazed how the mind will try to wander around. But by saying it out loud, it's more powerful. The sun is rising in my being. And then the moon settles in my being. The sun is rising in my being. And the moon settles in my being. In other words, if you're having a hard time just thinking it, saying the words brings you into a more concentrated focus, then you can drop to just the thought and the practice. That engages the body and the mind. Where th wherever intention goes, energy flows. That brings the energy up, the male meridians, and then the yin energy follows the female meridians. So by orienting your thoughts with the sun is rising in my being, that means male energy rising and the moon settling in my being, female energy settling, you can reharmonize the microcosmic orbit, which is the chief meridian that runs from your tongue, through your jaw, through your linea all but down, behind your testicles or vagina, and then the this is called the conception vessel, then the governing vessel runs up the back, through along the spine, through the neck, through the head, to behind the front teeth, and the tongue connects the two together. So by just practicing that belly breath with the thought, the sun rises in my being, and then letting go, and visualizing the moon coming down the front of the spine or the front of the meridians if you want, you begin to use your intention to move energy in the breathing cycle through the chief meridian of the body, which nourishes the others, calms you, centers you, and then all of a sudden one day you go into timelessness. You have no body. You don't even know you have a mind. You feel completely free of all this stuff. And you say, wow, this stuff really works. I should have been doing this years ago. And I say, hallelujah. Now's a great time to start. See you on my next video blog. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Paul Check.